Hello and welcome to the atrium of the Broadcast Center, uh, CBC's headquarters in Toronto. I'm Heather Hiscox and I'm the host of Morning Live on CBC News Network. We have a great well, as long as you want to ask questions, we are right here with you. Dr. Brian Goldman is with me. Dr. Goldman, of course, the host of the fantastic program on CBC Radio called White Coat Black Art. You hear that on Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m., Sunday afternoons, early evenings. 6.30 p.m. 6.30 p.m. That's when I always hear you as I drive coming back to Toronto, and I am always so interested, and I'm, I get to have a personal program today from you. <laughs> but our, what we talk about is in response to your questions. We are here in Canada, as you know, less than 24 hours away from the legalization of marijuana. So you can buy, you can grow, you can smoke pot legally, coast to coast to coast, as of 12.01 local time. And there are still, even just with these few hours remaining, many outstanding concerns and questions and issues Canadians have. We know because we're getting questions and phone messages and emails and tweets from you. Chief among the questions, questions about health. And so Dr. Goldman and I, Dr. Goldman, I'm just the moderator, your uh, conduit. Going to, going Don't to... undersell yourself. You know a lot about this. <laughs> well, I've had to, you know? I, yes, I think we've a lot had of to learn. have had to learn about this. But I've had to learn, and I've been immersed in study, people who have not had to do that for their work maybe are wondering, what on earth are we embarking on? Because it is uncharted territory. For you as an emergency room physician, what are you, what do you think we're going to see? And that seems to be the question on everybody's mind. Certainly emergency departments are preparing uh, for an onslaught of people who are going to try marijuana in one form or another. Personally, I don't think we're going to see a lot on the first day or the second right. day, but we are certainly bracing ourselves for more people who are unfamiliar with the effects of, of marijuana. Uh, maybe some of them will combine it with alcohol and will be inattentive, and maybe some of them are going to get into road accidents. I suppose a minority of them might have uh, severe intoxication, so there may be some people coming in with uh, tachycardia and elevated heart rate and agitation, and maybe they're seeing things. I don't think we're going to see too many uh, like that, but th those are the kinds of things that we're going to be looking okay. for. Are you worried? I am worried about a couple of things. I would say I'm worried about people who use marijuana and drive, particularly in combination with mm -hmm. alcohol, but by itself. Uh, and uh, driving next to them on, on uh, the major uh, highways and byways of, of, this, of this country. I'm also quite concerned about young people, young teens in particular, uh, getting the idea that if marijuana is legal, that it must be safe uh, in all circumstances, no matter how you use it, and that it's innocuous enough that, that it's been legalized. And I'm very concerned about the impact of, of repeated uh, and sometimes heavy exposure to cannabis uh, on the developing brain, um, and so, and by that I mean I'm concerned about the the uh, mental state, the emotional state, uh, what will happen to to people, to teenagers who use it, and what will happen to their intellectual capacity, their memory, their ability to to reason, their ability to do five things at once, and and to go on to college and university and become the people that 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 they want to become. Okay, interesting that you should focus on those two issues because those are exactly the two issues that we're hearing from parents, from people most notably. Driving is a huge question mark and a worry, and of course, the science, what do we know about the effect of marijuana cannabis on the developing brain? So we're gonna spend a lot of time on those particular issues. Obviously, it's your questions that drive our conversation today. We wanna to welcome you on CBC News Facebook page. We're live on, we're everywhere right at this moment, live on YouTube. Uh, my program, CBC Morning Live, we're up on the Twitter page, and CBC Radio, your host network, uh, we're, I'm joining in on them today. I'm not normally on the we're radio. We're just one big we're on happy the face. We today. are, so we have questions already. Let me stop mine and let's get right away to the very responsive uh, respon uh, way that we want to answer this. Um, Tracy asking on YouTube, what type of medical conditions allow you to get medical weed from a doctor? Uh, it, it, it isn't a specific set of conditions. You need to have the, the approval of a physician and, and uh, so it has to be uh, medically prescribed and we know that that system will remain in place for the next five years. I know a lot of people are wondering what's going to happen the day after. If there's recreational cannabis, does it mean that the, the medical system changes? So basically the kinds of conditions for which uh, marijuana um, it has, been, has been approved would include chronic pain, 
um, especially chronic pain, neuropathic pain. So that's pain that, that is caused by a nerve that's transmitting pain signals. Uh, and long after an injury has, has healed up. It could be uh, pain that's associated with cancer, cancer chemotherapy. Uh, cancer would be a condition um, having symptoms that uh, are not relieved by other condition, by, by other medications, so nausea associated with cancer treatment, uh, nausea associated with MS. MS would be another condition. Mm -hmm. Seizure disorders would be another. Uh, emotional states, so depression uh, for some people, anxiety states. Uh, and, and so it's not the condition itself. It, is there evidence that, that, that it's beneficial and have other treatments been tried? And it's really up to your doctor to, to go through the hoops uh, to, obtain, to obtain approval and, uh, and for you to obtain the supply. Okay, and, and related to that, Jay Ryan on Twitter asking, because it seems like a long process to be approved for uh, medical marijuana, he is interested, or Jay, I don't know, he or she wants to try CBD oil as a form of alleviating chronic pain. Uh, will we be able to buy oil in store and online? Not yet. Not yet, not, and, and, and remember, we're not talking about recreational use. We're talking right. about medical use. And, and, and because, of the, because the process is so long for medical approval, wondering if on the recreational side you can get it, but you can't. I, no, you can't, yeah. and, and the amounts that you have to consume for therapeutic purposes are much higher than the amounts that, that you would ordinarily obtain for recreational purposes, like two grams for the management of seizures. That would be a lot of marijuana to smoke, for instance, to get that effect, and, that, and so an oil would be the way to go. So you're going to have to go through the usual medical channels that you've been going through up until now. If you want to try, ask your doctor. Okay, uh, again, coming back to this notion of what CBD <clears throat> will uh, relieve, Iris G on YouTube, can that help with rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia? Would those be a couple of conditions that you would say people might find relief in medicinal marijuana? Yes, so CBD is uh, uh, cannabidiol, and that is the uh, ingredient that will bind to the CB1 uh, cannabinoid 1 receptor, but not cause the high that's produced by, by THC tetrahydrocannabinol. And, and the potential uses for, for CBD would include uh, seizures, uh, inflammation, uh, pain, it, and interestingly, it might actually be useful for psychosis, even though there are a lot of questions okay. about, about THC activating psychosis or perhaps um, activating a tendency, yes. unlocking that tendency to have schizophrenia. Um, but, but in this case, CBD may actually be effective for mental disorders, including psychosis, inflammatory bowel disease, nausea, migraine, depression, anxiety. So the short answer is I wouldn't call uh, CBD the number one treatment that I would try for rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory conditions, but yeah, um, if, if other treatments haven't worked and that sometimes happens, then, then it may be something that you can discuss with your doctor. I think that's the, the key piece of advice. You, you mentioned on several occasions we were speaking this morning on CBC Morning Live, check with your doctor. These are conversations that we're going to have to have. And the other thing, Heather, that I want to underscore here that's really important is that there's a huge difference between recreational marijuana and medical marijuana, and we're going to be conflating the two, and people are going to be wanting to know answers to, to either. But the, what's happening at 1201 uh, in, your, in your time zone is, is legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes right. only. Okay. And it's not kind of a wide open system for medical. On that point, Tammy Peters on Facebook with a really good question. Can you overdose on marijuana? Yes, you can. Um, to my knowledge, I have not heard of a, a fatality from an overdose of marijuana, but uh, you can certainly um, suffer from symptoms of, what, of what's known as marijuana intoxication or, can, or, or cannabis intoxication. The typical uh, signs and symptoms would include tachycardia, so elevated heart rate, agitation, um, hallucinations, mm -hmm. you can have auditory, so you may hear mm -hmm. things, you may see things. Uh, and uh, anxiety, and and these are the kinds of things that will land you in the emergency department. Uh, and you know, to an emergency physician like me, it might not look too dissimilar from to to uh, an overdose of of uh, crystal meth. Okay. Um, it's not identical, and and often people who use one substance use others. So we're we're very familiar with mixed intoxication. You know, it's interesting. 
I hope I'm going to get the details of this right, but I was just reading about something called the Maureen Dowd effect. Did you have you heard of that? Maureen Dowd is a columnist for the New York Times. Yes. Yeah. For for the purposes of writing, a couple of years ago, she did a bunch of edibles. I think brownies or right. and was literally in a ball for about eight hours because it was so powerful. And then you and I were talking on the air today about right. how an edible, because it, it's different high from smoking it, you don't know how high you're going to get. You may keep going. You may keep consuming, thinking that you're not going to get, it's not working on you or something, and then you can be really affected and end up in the So ER. let's unpack all of that. So all first right. of all, you're quite right. When you inhale, if you're used to smoking marijuana, it enters your lungs, it's absorbed very rapidly, goes straight to the brain, doesn't have to go to the gastrointestinal tract, doesn't have to be absorbed in that way. And if you use marijuana, you may be, if you smoke marijuana, you're, you may be very used to that effect. Although if you're a boomer, this is not your grandmother's marijuana. The potency may be three times, up to three times more potent than the marijuana that might have been there during the Woodstock days of, of 40 reefer years ago. Days. Reefer, the reefer madness <laughs> days. So, so you may be used to getting a quick high within, within 30 minutes. Um, when it comes to ingesting marijuana through edibles, the marine doubt effect, if you will, it, it can take, it can, you can begin to notice an effect within 30 minutes to two hours, but it can take up to 12 hours uh, to, to, to have a noticeable effect. And that's a problem if you're looking for the quick high that you get from, from smoking marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so if you're tempted to have another bite and another bite just to see what's going to happen, you may find that when it all hits you three or four hours down the road, you're very intoxicated and now you actually are hallucinating and you feel spacey and, and you don't feel safe. Uh, and, and it can take many hours for that to clear. Uh, a day or two would not be completely out of the question. That's amazing. People say, if you're going to try this for the first time, experiment. Start low, go slow. Don't just leap right in if you're, if you're, you're not a regular try user. Try a tiny bite and see what happens. Um, and I, I'm not recommending it. By exactly. the way, edibles will not be available for yeah, every year. Yeah, that's the other point. So I'm not saying that edibles are available. Uh, David James on Facebook. The health concerns that people have expressed seem to be stemming from THC. From CBD, uh, those strains, are the health concerns as great? Well, that, it's a complicated question. Uh, the, the health concerns, I guess the major health concern from THC would be uh, the impact on your mental state. And, and that takes us back to, for instance, uh, uh, a teenager or a young adult uh, possibly having a first psychotic break under the influence of, of, of THC. And the question is, is it schizophrenia or is it intoxication due to, to marijuana? We're not sure. We do know there's a, high, there's a correlation between cannabis use and schizophrenia. The more you use in your teenage years, the earlier and, and, at the, high, and the higher the dose, the earlier the onset. Um, part, so, so that's part of the health, health effects. The major health issue with cannabis is the uh, cannabis or marijuana uh, uh, use um, disorder. Okay. And, and as many as three out of every 10. The dependency the aspect. The dependency of aspect of it. Three out of every 10 adult regular users of marijuana uh, uh, can develop the marijuana use disorder and one in 10 can become addicted. And I know a lot of people are gonna say, you can't no become harm. addicted, no right. harm. No, you can. Okay. You can become addicted or you can, you can develop a use disorder such that when you try to stop taking it, the withdrawal symptoms motivate you and you may be craving uh, the, the marijuana and that drives you to keep using it. Now, remember that another uh, issue is smoking. Yes. So it's not just it's not just the active ingredients. It's also smoking. Um, if you're smoking marijuana, then you're going to be ingesting or, or smoking or inhaling uh, many of the same combustibles that are found in tobacco. The difference being that when you smoke marijuana, you smoke it more deeply and you hold it for a longer period of time than you would uh, a nicotine cigarette. Mm -hmm. um, there are studies that show that you're more prone to chronic bronchitis, certainly a chronic cough, having uh, more inflammation in, in your throat. Um, on the other hand, some recent evidence suggests that you may not be more prone to emphysema, which is something that, hmm. you know, I, that, that goes against what I was taught. And, and it's a reminder that you have to keep up with the, we have to keep up the with literature. the studies and the literature because, because the information, what we believe to be true changes. What about oral lung cancer? Any evidence on that? So the Canadian Cancer Society says that there is weak evidence that people who are regular users, and I'm, we're not talking about occasional use, we're talking about heavy, fairly frequent heavy users use. of, of okay. marijuana may be at greater risk of lung cancer, can, uh, oral cancers, cancers of the head and neck, 
but I would stress that the evidence is, is fairly weak, and I think we need a lot more a, a lot more data on we're that before we start saying that. We're likely to get a lot yes. more science on this now that we're in this new phase. Um, Similarly, you, you talked about the effect on the brain. It's interesting, and some people can't quite figure out why it's legal for 19, and yet the science indicates that the young brain is still forming yes. on into the 20s, maybe even up to 25. So what do we know about that to this point? None of this is conclusive, mm -hmm. but and because of what the brain is doing as a young adult, what the concerns are particularly for young consumers. So cannabis use that um, begins early in uh, adolescence when the brain is developing. There, there are two periods of time when the brain develops uh, has, has a big development period. One of them is, is when you're in the womb. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why, uh, that's probably the major reason why pregnant women should not be uh, using marijuana. And if they are, um, should not be heavy users of, of marijuana. And if they are heavy users of marijuana and discover they're pregnant, then they need to talk to their doctor about, okay. about what they're going to do uh, in that particular situation. So that's, that's development period number one, when, when you're setting uh, um, that that child up so, to so have severe learning disabilities. Can I just ask, so sure. we talk about fetal alcohol syndrome. Yes. You could have something similar from, there may be not be a name for that, or I don't know to, if this, there is. You're, you're making an excellent point. So you're talking about a, a baby that grows up into a four or five year old child who has poor impulse control, poor judgment, doesn't seem to be able to learn from consequences, um, may have learning disabilities, may have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That may be the first way that they're identified that there's something up with, okay. with, 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 with this child. So that's, that's development period number one. Yes. Development period number two is during adolescence. That's when the brain is really transforming itself. And, and if you have teenage kids, you, you understand <laughs> that, that adolescent kids are, are a different species yeah. of human being. And, and heavy, frequent use of marijuana uh, by teenagers, especially young teenagers, um, is associated with, uh, not in everybody, but is associated with um, emotional instability, um, cognitive deficits, difficulty focusing, difficulty staying on task, um, difficulty with cognitive load. So as the demands of secondary school get greater and greater, they may have difficulty, they may find it exhausting to try to pay attention in class and make notes and study math and, and try to take in lessons about physics and chemistry and, and they may have to get up and walk out, uh, walk out of the class and, and, and their teacher saying, what's up, what's up with this teenager? And, mm -hmm. and, and that is less likely to happen if you start using marijuana after the age of 25. So, so it's not hard and fast, no use until you're 25. But just remember that the more you use and the heavier, you, you're, the heavier your pattern of use in your teenage years, the more you're risking having intellectual problems later on. Definitely. And they may not be reversed by stopping marijuana. Okay. That was a question from Shell LeDrew. So thank you for that coming in on Facebook. And we should probably say, because we're about, oh my goodness gracious, we're 20 Time minutes in. Time flies when you're talking marijuana. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, Facebook and YouTube and CBC Morning Live's Twitter account and CBC Radio's Facebook page. We're uh, getting some wonderful questions. We and we're going to keep on going. Ryan Lee uh, watching on Facebook. You were talking, we were talking about smoking and the differences with tobacco. We had this question on CBC Morning Live, and I think it's a really interesting one. Secondhand smoke, yeah. uh, either from a neighboring condominium or from being in, in a house with somebody who smokes pot, or what they call a contact high, even if you're passing somebody on the street, if we could see somebody smoking on the street. Sorry, we're just doing some construction here in the atrium. It may, may be <laughs> piercing. Somebody's backing up into <laughs> us. They were so enamored of our conversation. They said, I'm going to back up. Uh, Going to, uh, anyway, then uh, we'll have whole other listen, medical issues that we'll have to address. Might. But anywho, okay, secondhand uh, smoke. Secondhand smoke. Uh, how much of an issue do you think that's going to be? So, so uh, first of all, you know, secondhand smoke. Um, if, if you're smoking marijuana uh, in a in an enclosed space. Uh, you're going to have secondhand smoke, and there will be people who have asthma, who have chronic obstructive lung disease, who are going to be more sensitive. Maybe they're hy hypersensitive to smoke. And, and I would gather that most provinces have specific legislation if you live in an apartment building or if you live in, in a, a condo uh, that you're, you, can't, you can't smoke indoors. Mm -hmm. so, so the general rule is take it outside. Now, the other question that's embedded in that is, is there THC in secondhand smoke? There is small quantities, mm -hmm. and and you know. Are Did you, you like my stat from this morning? I was blown away by your so stat. So here's my stat: the National Institutes of Health in the United States said that you had to be in a room 
with people smoking 16 joints an hour in order to be inhaling any sort of concerning level of THC. Now that was their measure. That's their measure and, and it's a fair point. So it's not a huge risk, but there is one exception that I think is a reasonable one. That I assume is what's the impact on an adult right. who happens to be passing by uh, or is in an enclosed room with 16 people smoking uh, uh, marijuana. Um, quite a party. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, what if it's a six month yes. old infant? And I'd like to be able to say common sense says don't smoke near an infant, but, but I would expect an infant to be more sensitive to um, a minute quantity of marijuana than an adult. So, so I would say that there's no safe limit uh, or yeah. safe amount of, of marijuana that you should be smoking in an enclosed room with an infant or a toddler. And I think, again, the reasonable course of action is to take it outside. So that was Ryan Lee's question. Thank you. And then uh, followed up by Sheena McCreedal on Facebook as well, wondering specifically about the impact of secondhand smoke on children. So I think you've answered that. Uh, Diana Lester, I'm not sure if we can answer this, but we can help maybe on Facebook. How do police stop drivers who are high at the moment? This is the kind of question that we'll certainly be having in a broader discussion of one's legal rights. But they'll look for, would they not, as alcohol sign? I mean, there are people called registered drug enforcement yes a uh, drug registered uh, they're they're getting specialized training to recognize the signs and then to operate the saliva testing mechanisms and all of these things yep. but until this is all said and done and it's again a patchwork across the country they're going to be looking for obvious signs of impairment on the road right so your guide will be very similar to looking for signs of impairment when it comes to alcohol use so you're going to be looking the, the, your the, uh, police trained police officers are going to be looking for uh, individuals who are swerving in and out of traffic, who don't appear to be um, changing their behavior to prevailing conditions on the road, uh, driving in an unsafe manner. So they have their ways of looking for impairment. And the important thing here is that it starts with a suspicion of impairment. And, and once there's a suspicion of impairment, you're, you know, you're pulled over and the police have the authority under the, under the new uh, legislation to, to request a blood test. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, they're gonna be uh, measuring your THC level uh, in nanograms uh, per, I gotta check it. Is it nanograms per liter or is it nanograms per ml? I will check that very quickly. And as very you do quickly. that, of course, this is you've just put your per ml per, per, per milliliter. So, okay. And the magic number is between two and five nanograms per ml. Certainly, if you're over five nanograms per ml, you're probably intoxicated. Although that that's more true for acute users, naive users, people who are trying it for the first time. Mm -hmm. If you have never experienced marijuana before and you've taken those edibles and now you're driving home, which you shouldn't be doing, then, uh, then, uh, then if you may be more sensitive to the effects of THC uh, than, uh, than somebody who's a chronic user and has become tolerant. It, it, it stores in the fat, isn't that right? And right. so if, again, it varies individually, it would vary with how much use, it would vary with uh, uh, regularity yep. of, of, of smoking. So this is why they're anticipating court challenges because determining what exactly constitutes an impairment figure is very difficult for all of those reasons. So uh, here are the offenses, driving under the influence, two nanograms or more, but less than five nanograms of THC per ml of blood, maximum $1,000 fine. Um, uh, driving offense number two, driving under the influence of cannabis. This is five nanograms or more of THC per one ml of blood. Um, uh, and then number three, driving under the influence of cannabis combined with alcohol. Don't combine alcohol with cannabis. Uh, 50 milligrams of alcohol per 100 ml of blood and 2.5 uh, uh, or nanograms or more of THC per ml. For those, uh, for offenses two and three, mandatory minimum, $1,000 fine. Uh, 120 days of imprisonment and uh, impounding of vehicles and all of these things and people who are uh, cannabis advocates who think this is this is an area where there are a lot of holes in the law and they plan to challenge these kinds of impairment things so these are the things that uh, for t tomorrow for example I know on CBC News Network we're going to be focusing a lot on the legality surrounding uh, legalization and the, the outstanding questions we'll put uh, those to some of our experts tomorrow similar to uh, Donna J Crow wondering on Facebook what are the rules around growing uh, and that's a situation where you're allowed to grow for plants personally but again it varies these are the things that we'll have clarification for you tomorrow I want to keep my discussion with Dr. Brian Goldman the host of um, White Coat Black Art on the health theme this is an interesting question from Stephanie the third on Facebook I keep getting info saying marijuana cigarettes cause depression and anxiety some would say 
they counter or they uh, or help you relieve those kinds yep. of conditions? Can they actually trigger? Yes, they can. They can trigger depression. Um, it really it depends on the the impact. Uh, um, we know that, for instance, you know I can say that 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 uh, THC is generally. Um, has been looked at as a possible treatment for anxiety, um, but if it's treatment for anxiety, then it might act as a depressant. Okay. And that's one of the things, you know, for instance, benzodiazepines, Ativan, um, which treats anxiety, which relieves anxiety, um, in, if taken in a high enough dose, and, and in some people at risk, might actually um, increase depressive symptoms. Uh, CBD um, may be more effective for psychosis, for uh, for mental health disorders, depression, what anxiety. What about PTSD? We had that question from Michael Leeson on YouTube. Uh, can it be used in PTSD situations? Potentially. 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 It's, it's, it's not the only treatment. Uh, there, are, there are other treatments that could be tried as well, EMDR. Um, uh, antidepressant medications, but but certainly it would be it would be not unreasonable to to try a cannabis if if other forms of treatment haven't worked. Here's an interesting question, policy-wise, from Catherine Morris. Um, again, uncharted territory. If it's medical use and it is uh, allowed and prescribed, will insurance companies cover the cost? Depends on the insurance company. I see. And and. Uh, so again, ch you'll have to check with the terms of your of your policy, but but uh, the answer is sometimes yes. Okay, um, Minecraft Grim on YouTube. We spoke of this earlier, perhaps missing part of our earlier discussion because we're having a wonderful one at one half hour in, and still the questions come. Uh, was about in terms of serious health implications, lung cancer. Can you just reiterate what you said on that point for this cancer? So the Canadian Question. Cancer Society says that that there is weak evidence of a some of a somewhat increased risk of lung cancer, oral cancers, cancers of the head and neck, um, with regular heavy users of, of marijuana, but the evidence is weak. Okay, uh, these are related. Jill Nadeau on Facebook and Andreas Mai on YouTube. If smoking is terrible, and as you've said, there are some of the components of, uh, of smoking tobacco that are similar, why are the edibles not being made available? Uh, it may be. That's an interesting I, that, policy that's an question, interesting, isn't it? That's, a, that's more of a policy question than, yes. a, uh, than, than, than a therapeutics question. It is part of, I guess, a slow rollout of, of seeing the landscape and seeing what happens after, after uh, uh, cannabis is legalized. I'm trying to think if, if part of the aim of the government is to is to remove some of the black market um, appeal, and we heard from Bill Blair, they hope to cut 25 to 50 percent out of the black market. Of so the, the first assumption year we'll would be see. that 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 more of that you're is you're not going to be doing brownies. You're not going to do that with right. brownies, are right. you? As you as you are if you're doing smoke. Um, and similar to this, uh, CBD CBD creams for pain and inflammation, CBC uh, CBD drops that you can put under the tongue. These are all things, the oils and the edibles and all of this coming online. Coming online. Coming online. Yep. All right. Um, Jason Dodd on Facebook, thank you very much. And again, we appreciate uh, your questions on Facebook, on YouTube, on our Morning Live Twitter account, on the Facebook page for CBC Radio. What a wonderful discussion with Dr. Brian Goldman. And uh, we'll stay right here until we have exhausted the questions. And once we start tomorrow, we'll have a whole new question whole when we start to see how it's actually yes. taking place. Uh, are legal dispensaries going to offer comparable pricing to products available on the illegal market today? See, this is a great question. And maybe not one for you, but we were having this discussion with Scott Peterson, who's our business host on, on Morning Live, and they're talking about the sweet spot for government is between 10 and $12, because they think that is something that will compete with the legal market. They can't charge 20 or there's not going to be any price incentive for people to buy, yeah. correct? But what we're also seeing, and there's some documentation in the Journal de Montréal today, that in Quebec already, black market dealers have cut their own prices, so they're undercutting. So the whole attempt to get into the black market by making a reasonable price, it's a market. It is competitive. and, and um, there is going to be a lot of competition for the pot dollar, I think. And I guess that's that's a, a fascinating distinction uh, uh, with the pharmaceutical industry, where there's a lot more control of pricing and 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 uh, not a lot of, of of price competition to to the detriment of patients who mm -hmm. uh, either have to pay out of pocket or or who subscribe or belong to drug plans that that have to foot the bill. We promised about a half an hour, so I think we have time for one more question. And why don't I make it Virginia McKay's question on Facebook? And this is, again, one of the questions um, which comes up often. How long does it impair me? THC 
if it stays in your blood for weeks, what if I smoked at a party last Tuesday? Mm -hmm. So thank so you, Virginia. There's impairment, and there is uh, and there is how long it stays in your system, and and they're two different things. We say that that if you smoke marijuana then you should not drive or operate dangerous machinery for four hours after. Uh, if it's an edible, um, six hours after. If you experienced a psychoactive high and you were you know, hallucinating and, and you were, uh, and, and had a very strong reaction, eight hours. Now that's, but, but keep in mind, that everybody's different. It yes. depends on whether you're using it for the first time or if you're a chronic user. We would expect regular chronic users to be more tolerant of, of those effects. Now, so that's impairment. Then there's the issue of is it still going to show up in your in your you know in a on a blood test, for instance? Is it still detectable? And and you know as has been as has been mentioned, um, it can stay in your system for it can be detectable for 28 days mm -hmm. or 30 days. But remember. No two people are exactly alike, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, what you should know is that THC uh, is fat soluble, which means it is going to be stored in the fat soluble parts of your uh, of your body, including the brain, and it will slowly leach out, and and it's in the leaching out that it becomes detectable in the bloodstream, and the rate at which that happens uh, is is different from one person to the next. Um, and this becomes important if, as a condition of your employment, you have to be free from marijuana. And and you know, would we expect an airline pilot, for instance, to be to be free? Like there, are, you know, this isn't just a human rights issue. It's it's an employment public standards safety. issue, public safety issue. And you have the right, or employers have the right, to demand for certain occupations that 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 you test negative. And if you test positive because you used a certain number of days ago, then, then consequences may ensue. This is another area that we're going to be talking about because unions, for example, are expecting workplace challenges. Some police forces yeah. have, you just have to show up fit for duty. Some have a 28-day prohibition, pilots do as well. Some have an absolute prohibition, and these are the things they vary from, from force to force, employer to employer. There will be challenges, and these are the kinds of legal issues that we anticipate in the future. I'm just wondering, we'll, we'll leave it at that as far as your questions, and again, thank you for them, but I'm, I'm, on your blog, you, you write a blog, and it's well worth your time, Dr. Goldman's blog, you were looking at what the CMAJ, the Canadian Medical Association Journal, was saying, wondering about what if we've embarked on this path and it's the wrong one. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? So it has been described and in that editorial that you're talking about, which you can you can read and uh, and read my blog at cbc.ca slash whitecoat. Um, it's being regarded as a large uncontrolled experiment. And and uh, Canada is one of the first countries, certainly will be one of two countries. To Uruguay, five years ago. Nation, to have nationwide mm -hmm. uh, legalization of marijuana. The United States, of course, has a number of states that have legalized it, but not across the entire United States. So, so it, the, yesterday, the substance of the Canadian Medical Association Journal's ed editorial by Diane Kelsall, who's their editor-in-chief, um, was that the, the, uh, the federal government is going to need to monitor the patterns of use and look for, for evidence of harm. And, and there is a belief out there that, that all that's going to happen with legalization of, of marijuana is that we're going to be shifting people from obtaining illicit, illegal marijuana to obtaining licit or legal marijuana, and that's it. But uh, the main point that was driven home in that editorial is that if in, instead of that there's a general increase in the consumption of marijuana in, in, in this country, then the point of the editorial is, is that the legislation will have failed. It will not have done what it, what it set out to do, which is to simply legalize what has been considered criminal behavior. And if that happens, the editorial makes the point that, the, that, that Parliament, the government, should acknowledge that, that, that it didn't do its job and amend the legislation to, to control the, the increase in use. And, and this is important because you have market forces that are now being unleashed, mm -hmm. that have a profit motive, that want to be able to, to grow the market, and that means not only converting the, the people who, receive, who, who were obtaining marijuana through illicit sources to 
uh, or to, to obtaining it through lawful sources, but also to grow the market by getting them to consume more in many different ways and possibly to attract new users of marijuana. So we lifetime could be, users. Lifetime users of marijuana. So we could be looking at, at increased increased use of marijuana and I can tell you that there's data from Colorado where they legalized marijuana in 2014 and they have seen a 29% increase in overall consumption uh, by adults. So it is a large uncontrolled experiment mm -hmm. and it begins in 12 hours. 12, uh, 13, uh, 12 hours and 55 minutes where we are yes. in the province of Ontario. It will vary. That was really fun. It was fun. Thanks yeah. so much. I really appreciate and that. And it was healthy fun. We it didn't use. No None of us used, used in, the, uh, in the preparation of this. Hopefully uh, we've answered some of your questions. And I just want to say for tomorrow, hopefully you'll be joining us on CBC Morning Live. Dr. Goldman was in three hours with me. There are questions once it becomes legal. What are your rights? as a condo owner or as a tenant? What are your rights in the workplace? What are your rights when you get on a plane, flying within the country, flying into the United States? What are your rights at the border? These are things that, again, Canadians don't have a firm grasp on. These are the questions that we're going to turn our attention to tomorrow. Once recreational marijuana is legal in this country, the only G7 nation, Dr. Goldman, with coast to coast to coast legalization. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow, 6 Eastern on CBC Morning Live.